Um, this workshop is a continuation in many ways of last week's workshop, um, kind of letting the, letting the system speak for itself. And if you work with hypoxia, you should pro you would probably know that um, this is not uh, just a regional issue. This is something we see all across the world nowadays in most um, areas with development. Because we are so fortunate uh, in the Baltic Sea that we have these very long time series and we were able to reconstruct more than 100 years of uh, hypoxic conditions and we can see that over time there has been more than a tenfold expansion of hypoxia in the Baltic Sea. So, so just to, to summarize that um, if we look at the Baltic Sea, um, we have different types of hypoxia. In the central part, the deep parts, we have perennial hypoxia, and that's why it's showed uh, as a time series. So it's developing on, you could say, more a decadal basis. I'm going to do with the relatively long resistance time of the bottom water. The total resistance time of the Baltic Sea is around 30 years. So seasonal hypoxia. And we can look at that over, you could say, seasonal scale. So autumn uh, storms, they start uh, mixing up the water column again. And then we have episodic hypoxia, like the one that's shown in panel C down here. This is from a site uh, in Denmark and Estuary called Limfjorden, where you can see that, that it's very episodic, that it can be uh, developing uh, quite fast, and it can also disappear quite fast. It depends on wind conditions. It is naturally prone to hypoxia. And that has to do with its uh, that the exchange to the open ocean is very restricted. And, and at the same time, we have a freshwater surplus. Um, this is around uh, 16,000 cubic meters per second, or on an annual basis, around 500 cubic kilometers of water that needs to, to go out. Another thing is that they don't only bring oxygen to the bottom waters they also enhance the stratification. And this means that the, the more saline inflow you have, uh, the more stratified conditions will prevail in, in the Baltic Sea. And this means that the vertical mixing is reduced. Let's move on. This is uh, real data showing actually from a number of cruises uh, how such an intrusion can actually uh, play out. This is an index just showing how irregular these salt water intrusions are. The thing of, 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 that, um, of that salt water intrusion was that it improved the oxygen concentration. So it happened much faster than any of the models uh, would predict. And I should say that many of the models that we have there um, are well developed in supply. It uh, is reduced and, and it's reduced because of uh, warming. Over the years, a lot of things have been done around the Baltic Sea to upgrade all major treatment plants to tertiary treatment. Uh, we haven't been so effective in terms of regulating the aquaculture as we've had with urban uh, wastewater treatment plants, to put it um, frank. So if there is, if you believe there is a lot of transport of organic matter from uh, from the sites, from the shores towards the deeper part of the uh, Puget Sound, this could be uh, quite important in terms of understanding high oxygen demands in, uh, in the deep waters. So the new epiphany that is that we have this uh, input ceiling. So, so instead of having a reduction target, there's a maximum amount of nutrients that uh, member states can actually discharge into different basins of the Baltic Sea. And it turned out that in both cases, the aerial extent would approximately double. Um, so this really shows that temperature is a key player in this. And it's a key player because it has two effects basically on, 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 on oxygen. It reduces solubility and it increases the oxygen demand simply by enhancing respiration. Some critics out there arguing that, well, you know, we've invested so many you know, billions of, of Danish krona or dollars for that matter in reducing uh, nutrient inputs from treatment plan. And we're also regulating uh, agriculture to uh, a very high degree. And they were saying, we're not seeing, you could say the improvements yet. And, and the claim was that it's basically, it's the science, the scientists had misunderstood something, you know, because apparently there is no effect of all this, of this huge investment. So instead, I did together with a colleague, we put we made a newspaper article 
and we showed well what would have happened if we hadn't reduced Newton inputs, if we hadn't had the Newton management plan. And in this case, it showed with an average year of 2009, we would have had the double extent of hypoxia. If so, the, the drivers of hypoxia, we have to acknowledge that the Baltic Sea is naturally prone to hypoxia due to the restricted change. And the main culprit of that is the Newton input from land. And I haven't shown anything from the geological past, but we know that that hypoxia was also has happened several times in the deepest part of the Baltic Sea in the geological past, but it has never been as widespread as it is right now. And we have this saltwater inflow. They modulate hypoxia in the Baltic Sea. They do give a short-term relief for oxygen, but they also enhance the stratification and then enhance also hypoxia in the long term. So there's, there's a good side and there's a long-term negative side of these saltwater inflows. And the seasonal hypoxia that we have that we experience, especially in the Tengri Straits, they will become more frequent and they will also expand if in the warmer climate, if we don't do further nutrient reductions. So, so let's move on. These coping me mechanisms in turn create indirect effects and those indirect effects uh, we think exist, but they're, they're proving to be uh, really challenging to predict. So that's where the humility part comes in. So thinking about what happens if you're an organism that gets exposed to low dissolved oxygen, we can start thinking about what are the types of things that an organism can do. So if the environment is not great, uh, you can just pick a new environment. So the other thing you can, uh, an organism can do is uh, change the fundamental circulatory system. So uh, organisms have a lot of plasticity. They can change the gill surface area. Uh, they can change the gas solubility by changing the hematocrit volume um, and can change the circulation rate. Organisms can also um, moderate their tissue demand. Um, in other words, um, during periods of, of low oxygen stress, um, uh, rather than exercising vigorously, um, they can just uh, uh, resort to core metabolic demands to grossly simplify things, if you are a thing like this particular sea star that can't move very well, move very well, um, you, you just generally were always absent from there. Uh, but if you are a thing like an English soul that is pretty good at moving, uh, you're pretty good at just leaving the area when things get bad. Uh, then when things get better, you come right on back. Next slide. And we saw a really similar thing even in nearshore habitat. So all the stuff I showed you was at depths of um, uh, 30 meters down all the way to 120 meters. Um, we did lots of stuff nearshore and saw a really similar thing. Um, this was definitely a condition with moderate oxygen depletion. So we don't expect to see the, the krill stampeding to the surface during the daytime. So what we expected to see was lower predator-prey overlap, reduced feeding rate on zooplankton, um, because of that reduced overlap, we expected to see increased zooplankton density because we don't have fish feeding on them, and then reduced predator density, uh, primarily because we expect them to move to areas where there are more foraging opportunities. Generally struck out in terms of our expectations. So, and I want to really emphasize is that um, the herring in this study, which seemed to be like the main character, is they were exposed to oxygen concentrations that we've demonstrated are lethal when we do it in a laboratory study. Yet when we are out there sampling, those herring did not seem to be upset at all. In fact, they were lying. Um, and the key thing about this is it, it touches on this idea that, that Jakob uh, talked about is that an organism's oxygen requirements depends on temperature. L namely, as things get warmer, metabolism increases, you need more oxygen. So it's really, really hard to think about temperature uh, requirements or oxygen requirements separately. Estimate threshold effects. Yes, emphatic slam dunk across the board. Uh, so we're still working on this uh, work right now. Um, we, we've got um, two things going on, one of which I have an emphatic answer and one of which we're still working on. The first is and ask whether we could do a hierarchical modeling approach to ask whether there's a conservation of of oxygen sensitivities and temperature dependence across taxonomic groups. And um, that didn't work at all. <laughs> and I think it largely didn't work because we didn't have sufficient replication of species across different experimental setups. So I think we were chasing a lot of essentially noise. To what extent can we use 
existing species distributions, either say on the coast, uh, up in Alaska, in British Columbia, a combination of all of those, um, and can that reveal the underlying sensitivities and the parameters for the metabolic index or some other threshold-like function? And we're in the midst of doing thing that, so I don't have an answer. One is a vulnerability analysis where you take a look at a species over the course of its life history and you're looking at two things. Is one, are they exposed to levels of oxygen that are harmful? And we should say probably oxygen and temperature. And then uh, what is the subsequent consequence at the species level? And typically we're looking at key demographic rates such as mortality, development, and growth. And looking throughout the entire life history we think is incredibly important um, I always think about thresholds as a cliff. Um, and as a person going on a hike, I wanna, wanna know two things. I wanna know where is the cliff and where am I relative to that cliff? And if I think I'm pretty far away from that cliff, I know I'm not at risk and I don't need to be super careful with every single step. Now, if I don't know exactly where I am relative to that cliff, uh, I'm gonna perceive that as a pretty risky situation. Uh, and I'm gonna pay a lot of attention to uh, every step that I take. So fortunately, oxygen is a thing that operates in a threshold-like manner. In other words, when there's plenty of oxygen, things are fine. It's only when you drop below. So I do think we have the potential to try to quantify these thresholds, quantify our uncertainty on those thresholds, and we can quantify our uncertainty of where we are relative to those thresholds, which is perfectly suited to a risk-based approach. Scientist hat, I would say absolutely. Um, uh, you say a 0.2 reduction, that reduction is highly contextual. Uh, depends on where you're starting, what the what the organisms are that are present in that area. Uh, and then what does that 0.2 mean relative to the pushing you towards a threshold? Is it moving you to the realm where you're worried about that threshold? Uh, or, or is it a, a pretty small change in risk. Like the ecological situation in these terminal inlets where we are projecting EO problems might be different than the Euphazid and Herring Hake story that you told. Is anyone looking at what, what those ecological relationships are related to DO and temperature and, and pH? A wetland that's been um, further flooded or you have sea level rise in the wetland and you mobilize more of the organic matter there. Uh, what's the fate of that organic matter? How much of that will actually end out in the very deep areas when, where you have, you could say problems with oxygen. But it's, it, I think it's a good question and, and I think to be honest, we, we do not know, and I think it's very site dependent. From this perspective, I think we have been quite efficient in terms of reducing nutrient inputs also from diffuse sources. Um, some of that was actually uh, a lot of it has been to do uh, has to do with uh, using catch crops, for instance, in winter. It was introduced already in the nineties. Uh, stock you can have per hectare, so um, that's also regulated. We used to have until only uh, make fert or apply fertilizers up to 90% of, of the optimum yield. Um, that regulation was changed. And maybe that's also one of the reasons why we are seeing, you could say, a reversal of, uh, of oxygen depletion conditions right now. And so the objective of, of this uh, work will be to describe the potential risk to Puget Sound species. Risk assessment framework quantifies risk to species, habitats, whatever, in terms of a combination of exposure to a stressor and the sensitivity um, to that stressor. And you can also describe this in terms of vulnerability, which I think is appropriate in this, in this context. Um, where you might you might um, modify exposure and sensitivity by the adaptive capacity of the species or the habitat. Um, in that case, describing more of a vulnerability than a risk. Use um, to describe this kind of first component of exposure, which is um, species distribution. So, where are species on the landscape? 
um, is the Atlantis Ecosystem Model, which has been developed by Hem Morzaria Luna and colleagues um, at Long Live the Kings and the Northwest Fisheries Science Center, um, because we know that this is largely a, an issue at depth. Suggested, um, there's a lot of measures that we'd want to bring in that sort of modify the relevance of um, these strictly uh, metabolic values like PCRIT or, or metabolic index. So it's, it's an oldie, but it's a goodie, and it's scribe exposure um, in sort of a categorical framework. Um, and this helps us a lot, as has been mentioned, you know, there, we have um, data gaps, we have uncertainties, um, we have at species adaptation, um, we have these like coping mechanisms. And by taking this sort of um, categorical approach or qualitative approach to describing exposure or risk, um, that allows us to incorporate some of this uncertainty, I think. You can take a multi-stressor approach or you can take um, a single stressor approach to multiple species and help us identify um, where might be our, our priorities for action. Um, there are more issues associated with nutrient inputs than simply low DO. And I think that, um, you know, what Tim pointed out in terms of indirect effects, I think a lot about habitat. And I'm kind of inspired by, you know, could we use some of Tim's approach in, in hood sport um, and apply it to these thermal inlets for, um, and, and then use this framework, you know, what species and, and look at their risk um, and then um, go forward with, okay, what might be the harm um, to the system directly? And then I love the, and also indirectly from nutrient loadings in these places.